Thanks, Tops. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It is so great to be here. I love this topic that we're on, but last week, actually, Tops and Rick spoke to us. It sounds like I've got a lisp on this mic. Maybe I do. Um, last week, they spoke to us on this vision of Doxa Day and this, that we are a family on mission. And I guess if you were here for the first time last week and you're back here again, it means something must have resonated in your heart on this specific issue. And, and I trust that as we speak on this new topic as well on monopoly, that something also will come loose in your heart. And, but I must be honest, I'm going to speak from the angle of being a Christian. So if you're here and, you, and you're not a Christian, I believe something also will be relevant to you as, as we dive into this topic. But let's just take a look at this whole game called monopoly. So it was actually invented by a lady. Her name was, was Lizzie Margie. And she actually invented this game to speak against something. She was against private monopolies that were, were standing up, that all, all property was owned by a few, and then it had an impact in the world. And she actually patented this game in 1904 already. It was then called the landlord's game. And then after that, obviously, it developed into monopoly. <clears throat> But the, the aim of this game is that you will own as many properties as you can. And then if you have so much properties that other people start owing you money, and the one that wins is the one that has all the money and everybody else is bankrupt. It sounds like a good game. It's a good moral story. It's actually teaching you something. And we all played it except for two people, apparently. So we all know how this game works. So... The idea is there are properties that are less valuable and there are properties that are more valuable. There are stations, there are utility companies, and even a prison. But I think in South Africa we have to rewrite this game. Because our utility companies, it's called ESCOM and Randwater. So there must be different kind of rules into our version of this game. So I want to suggest a few rules. So <clears throat> if you own ESCOM, if you bought that property, and somebody comes and lands on you, you as the owner gets to throw the dice. And whatever that number is would be the number of load shedding. <laughs> Level one or six. So whatever that number, or 12 could be, you move back those number of spaces. Okay, so th that's, ne that's, that's a way. But the other thing is you still pay the full utility bill. No matter how many back spaces you go back, because that's how it works. So the other thing is that if you play this game long enough and if all the properties have been bought, everybody gets load shedding. <laughs> not only the person landing on the thing because our grid is not designed for all of those properties. So if anybody lands on it and whatever that number, everybody moves back. Makes sense. That's South African version of those things. So then there's also this go to jail. You know that there's this little block that you can land on or you draw a card and it says go to jail. Go straight to jail, do not pass beginning, do not collect salary. <laughs> Except if you work for ESCOM. Yeah. If you own ESCOM, you get a double retrenchment bonus. <laughs> and if you're a politician, you get a permanent, or a family member of a politician, you get a permanent get out of jail free card. <laughs> just playing it in the right way in our country. Okay, that's just a bit of humor. But maybe on a more serious note, we all have a get out of jail free card. We call it grace. And that grace is not something, it's someone. Jesus is our get out of jail free God. Because he paid the price for each one of us. He bought our freedom. The question that we need to answer is what do we do with this freedom? How do we steward this freedom that God has given us? And this morning, I want us to dive into that a bit. Maybe you're asking this question often, why do we all want money and we never have enough money? Maybe the other question that you might be asking you now is, why does the church speak so much on money? Well, is it because they want my money? Let me put you at ease with that one. We don't want your money. Because we are the church. We are the body. We steward what God has given us. We steward His resources for His ministry. So the church has a mission, and that mission needs money. And we are the stewards of all of that. So yes, the church does speak on money. But I've got a good mind. You think more about money than we speak on money. 
probably every day. That's why Jesus spoke so much about money as well. Maybe we should ask different questions. Maybe these are the questions we need to ask. Do I have enough money to live out my calling? Or maybe the question should be, am I the vessel that God wants me to be for his kingdom? Because then I can steward whichever comes through me and my life will have an impact. Maybe those are the questions that we, we should rather answer. So then let's look at what does stewardship mean. So a steward is someone entrusted with the responsibility of taking care of someone else's property or possessions. So that's what a steward means. So let's just understand this in the context of who God is. Deuteronomy 10 verse 14 says the following. To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Okay, let's just get the logic of this. The heavens, everything up there that we cannot see or even imagine, and everything on the earth belongs to God. So what do I own? No, if everything belongs to Him, I can only steward what belongs to Him, because everything belongs to Him. So He is the source of everything. He does entrust resources to us. We do have the ability to make decisions and choices. How are we going to use those resources? How are we going to apply that for His kingdom and for His glory? We have that capacity. It's scary that God actually entrusts humankind with that responsibility. But He chose that. He says, I will give you the responsibility. It's all mine. But you know what? I'm going to give you the opportunity to manage it for me. So stewardship is not something that the church wants from you. Stewardship is something that we get to do. It's something that we have to live out. It's actually what we are designed for. We are designed to be stewards. It's if you understand that and you start walking in that stewardship, that you will actually experience the freedom of it. There's peace in the understanding that you are a steward. Because if everything belongs to God, He's the owner. I'm just the vehicle. There are boundaries that protect me when I'm walking in his stewardship. There's also this area that I can come to my father and say, Lord, help me. What do I need to do in this situation? How do I address these issues and these needs in my life? And I'm not saying it won't be difficult. There will be difficult times. But I'm not doing it on my own because I'm stewarding God's resources for him. So stewardship doesn't take from you but gives to you. Can I say that again? Understanding stewardship does not take anything from you. It actually gives you something to steward. God trusts you with that. To want your own way and do everything the way you want, it's actually a rebellion. It's not only rebellion towards God, it's rebellion towards yourself as well. So what would be the purpose of stewardship? So God appoints us over all the resources in His wisdom. And ultimately, he wants to build his kingdom. He wants his glory to be manifest. Habakkuk 2.14 says, the, the earth will be covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We get to enjoy that. We get to participate in bringing glory to God. As we discover him, as we start experiencing him, as he starts trusting us, we start glorifying him and we establish his kingdom for his glory, but we get to enjoy it as well. Matthew 6 verse 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be given to you as well. God knows what we need. Seek first his kingdom. Then let's just have a moment and we look at the accountability of stewardship. I want to tell you the story. It's almost a bit like Jean and Sonia's story. But there was this farmer in the Dalmas area very successful farmer. And he realized there's a need in Africa. There's not enough food supply. And because he was successful, yeah, he thought he will go and establish some more farms in Zambia. But to do that, he had to appoint managers over his farms. And he had these three farms. The one was 5,000 hectares, the other one was 2,000 hectares, and the other one was 1,000 hectares. So he appointed a manager over each of these farms. The 5,000 hectares had 500 head of cattle on the farm. The 2,000 hectares had four fields under irrigation and a couple of dry lands as well. And then the last one, the 1,000 hectares, had 200 sheep on it. So he went away, trusted them, he started the new farms in Zambia. 
after a year, he came back. So he goes back to the farm where the 5,000 hectares is, and he sees, and he speaks to the manager, and the manager tells him, no, you know what? Those 500 head of cattle that you have, you, I've doubled that for you. <laughs> and the, man, the, the owner of the farm is so impressed. He says, wow, well done. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Of a little I've appointed you, of a much I will appoint you later. Then he goes to the farm with the 2,000 hectares, and the manager comes and he says, you know what? Those four fields of irrigation, I've doubled it. I've actually doubled the harvest of this land for you. Once again, the owner was so impressed, he rewarded him well. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Of a little I appointed you, of a much I will entrust with you. And then he went to the, the last one, 1,000 hectares, and, and the manager was there, and he, and he comes running to the owner, and he says, oh, I'm so glad you're back. You know what, I was struggling, and, and I was so concerned that I would lose any of these sheep because, these sheep because I know you are, a, you are a very hard owner, and you're very tough. So you know what, I kept all the sheep in one pen. So they're all there, but, but they're a bit skinny, they're a bit thin. And the owner said, you useless manager. You know what? Even if you just let the sheep out, they would have multiplied by themselves. You are not a good manager. And he fired him right there and took away his farm and gave it to the other two managers to look over. Do you recognize this story? <laughs> just the modern version of the talents. He gave to one five, the other one two and one. And it's the same outcome. We will be held accountable to what God is entrusting us to manage on his behalf. There will be consequences, but there will also be rewards. That's what the word teaches us. There's a thing called authority, but with authority, we need to take responsibility. And when we take up the responsibility, we will be held accountable for what God has given us authority over, each one of us, and corporately. God is entrusting this amazing thing to us. And this is why Jesus makes this statement in Luke 16, verse 10. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. I think sometimes we like the words of Jesus, but we do not imitate his life. We mustn't only listen to the words, we must live it out. Because that's where we will get the fulfillment of life. If you're not faithful with what you have now and the opportunities that you have, why would God trust you with more later on? John Maxwell made this statement. He says, you will never become what you are not becoming right now. You will never become what you are not becoming right now. So if you say you want to be generous and you're not generous now, you'll never be generous. If you're not responsible now, you will not be responsible one day. If you're not a good steward now, you will not be a good steward one day. He says, what we are doing now, this is what we will become. So the more I dive into what God has given me, the more of that will reflect in my life later on. That's being a good steward. God loves us. He loves us so much that he actually trusts and trust the whole of creation to us. Okay, let's look at the attitude of a steward. Now, this is a very sensitive part and a topic because maybe you're sitting here and you say, but I've worked hard for my money. You know what? It's my money and I did all of this to get this money. We just showed you that it's actually not your money. <laughs> just God gave you the opportunity to steward it for him. Deuteronomy 8, verse 17 to 18, it says, you may say to yourself, my power and, my, and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. The reward of great resources is not the problem. It's when you become entitled. And you think, I deserve it instead of stewarding it. Then it's a problem. I don't know who said this, I heard this one day, somebody said, your attitude determines your altitude. It's a very cool thing to say. What does it mean? It means the attitude that I have towards what God is entrusting me with will determine how much he will trust me, the altitude at which I will be flying. Somebody else said this, attitude is your best friend or your worst enemy. Which one it becomes will largely depend on the choices you make. 
So your choices determine your own attitude towards the resources that he's given you. Then let's look at the power of stewardship. When we become wise and faithful stewards, it has power. Because everything that happens or does not happen on earth is determined by our faithfulness in stewarding what God has given us. So when you look at the world and you don't like the way it's looking at the moment, whose fault is that? It's not God as the owner's fault. He's entrusted us with managing his creation. We are messing it up and we've been doing it for centuries. And then people ask, but how can God? It's not how can God, how can we? How can we not trust him to steward what he has given us in a way that will glorify him? That is the power, but if we align with what he wants, just think of our city, and I can see the evidence already. We are so blessed to live in this city. Now, so many life-giving things happening. I visited this week an a area in the, the western part of our city, and there were, there's a ministry that, that just ministered to people that are down and out, and I thought, thank God. People driving all the way from the east of the city all the way to the west of the city to go and minister to people that are in need. Being stewards of their resources and taking their resources to uplift and empower other people. So let's say, how will we steward this? I just when Tops was speaking and, and Rob's word as well, I just realized God will not lay anything ill-fitting or heavy on you. That's what scripture says. So if you're feeling this burden that you're carrying and it's heavy, my question would be, are you stewarding what God has in mind or are you trying to steward what you have in mind? Because the word says, he will not lay anything ill-fitting or heavy on you. His yoke is light. So are we stewarding what he has in mind for you or are you chasing something else? Okay, so let's look at what do we steward. The first thing that comes to mind, obviously, is money. And we always think about money. Now, that's the thing that we steward. I just want to say it's actually everything. Stewardship encompasses everything. Because everything that's in heaven, everything that's on earth, nothing is not covered under that, that we steward. We steward separately as individuals, but we also need to steward corporately. So what are these things that we need to be faithful stewards of? Let's just take a moment and look at ourselves. What do we steward? I think the first thing that we need to think of is the time. Maybe you don't think of time as a resource, but we all get time. The way we invest our time will determine how good stewards you are. Just listen to the word, invest, not spend. We are willing to spend time very easily. But what are we investing our time in? If God has given us a certain time on the earth, how are we using our time? for his kingdom and his glory. Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, which is none of us obviously, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He says, buy out that time. The time that we have, we need to live it fully for him. Then the next thing is our physical bodies. Did you ever think about that? Your body is not even yours because everything is his. So even your body, are you stewarding your body? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Are you taking care of your body? Are you stewarding this vehicle, this vessel, that will bring glory to God. Because if you don't take care of your body, you cannot be the vehicle that God has intended for you. If you waste away your body, you cannot be the power that God wants to work through you. Take care of yourself. Then talents and spiritual gifts. We steward the talents, the abilities that we have. As believers, we understand that even if you're not a believer, God has given you gifts. You're, you're created in a certain way. You have certain capacity. You have certain skill sets, abilities. Are we stewarding that? Or do we think it's mine? Steward it for God. There's freedom in it. It's not something that God's taking away from you. It's something he gave to you and he wants to empower you to have even more of that and experience it for his glory. But there's also the idea of spiritual gifts, which the Holy Spirit gives us. We need to steward that as well. Because that's how we build the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So the gifts that we, it's for the common good, not for your glory 
or to make you richer or bigger or smart or whatever. It's to serve his kingdom. And then one that's very close to my heart, the, the last one, it's almost like a fresh revelation for me, is the fact that I need to steward relationships, influences and opportunities. Have you ever thought about that, that the relationships that you are in, that you are actually stewarding that for God as well? Let me give you the, the highest responsibility that anybody gets on this planet is to be a parent. God entrusts you with another human being's life. And he says, you steward that life. It's not your child, it's his child. You'll know that when they turn 21 one day and then they leave you and then you miss them and they don't phone you and you long for them. <laughs> yeah, you can see my kids are older, isn't they? So that's gonna happen to all of you. Then you realize I was only stewarding them. They're God's children. And we need to steward them well. If you're a leader, God is entrusting people to you. He wants you to give them the opportunities to develop them so that they can become what God has in mind for them. That's stewarding relationships. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 to 20. All this is through God who, recon who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the message of reconciliation. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are stewarding relationships and we need to bring reconciliations between people and God as well. That's our responsibility. We're stewarding that as well. He says we are ambassadors. You know what an ambassador does? An ambassador represents a nation. In our context, represents a kingdom. So we are the ambassadors of God's kingdom. We are stewarding his kingdom. What is the culture of this kingdom that he's entrusted us with? It's love. Are we stewarding his love to other people well? He entrusts his love. He gives it to us. But we also need to be stewards of this love that we've received. And then the last one is revelation and truth. Matthew 13, verse 11, he says, And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. It's in the context where Jesus was speaking to people and some did not understand. And then he actually goes on and he says, to those that have, he will be given more. And those that do not understand will even be taken away from them. God reveals stuff to us. He opens up truth in his word and through uh, his spirit. If we don't go and apply that, we will lose that. Has it ever happened to you that if you don't respond to the Holy Spirit often enough, then after a while you... It's almost like you get blunt. Is that the right word to the, the working of the Holy Spirit? I can remember there was a season in my life, I love hearing God's voice. I love you know, words of wisdom, words of knowledge and, and functioning in the Spirit. And then there was a season that it didn't happen. And then I realized, but I'm neglecting it. If there's a revelation, you need to share that revelation. Sometimes it will be publicly, but most of the time it's for somebody. Go and share that. Because the more you do it, the more God will trust you with it principle of stewardship. The more he can see that you're taking his truth, you're making it your own, the more truth he will reveal to you. The more he shows you revelation, the more you share it, the more he'll give to you. Because you are being a good steward of what he's given to you. And then the last one is the, the concept of material resources. That's the one where it comes to money. And I just want to say, if you want to say no, money is not important at all, it's not true. Money is very important. <laughs> Our world functions on money. I suppose maybe if you live in a very remote village somewhere in Africa and you produce your own food, uh, you don't need that much money. But even then you'll need some money to trade with. And you probably have to pay taxes as well. So you'll need money. Okay, so everybody needs money. So money in itself is not a problem. Money is actually very powerful. You know why money is powerful? Because it opens up opportunities. Money opens potential. Are you taking those opportunities, that resource, and you're using it in the right way? Do you understand that money can actually open up areas where God's kingdom can be extended? That's why the church uses money. The church also needs money to make things happen. That's the way our world is. You know what also? That's the beautiful thing of money. It addresses your needs, but it also gives you the possibility 
of this most incredible passion that you have to empower you to live out your passion as well. And money does that. So the way that we think about money is important. And I want to invite you in the next few weeks to come and join us, to come and listen to the concept. How do we understand money? You know, Jesus spoke more about money than anything else apparently, but with the concept obviously of his kingdom and love as the basis for that. So money opens up possibilities, I said, but money also reveals something of who we are. Money is actually the mirror that you can sometimes see yourself in. So if the mirror will show your fears, the way you use money will show your fears. It will show your priorities. It will actually reveal your expectations, your insecurities, and probably your motives as well, the way that you use money. So who's the boss? Who's your boss, God or money? Because if God is the owner of all things and you put that lens on, you view money in a different way. But if you use money to view God, you'll have a very limited view of God. It should be the other way around. If you can see the world through God's lens and you see money through God's lens, it's very empowering. It brings freedom. I want to end off and actually create a moment for you just to reflect for a moment. Just speak to God. He's called each one of us. He's empowered and he entrusts each one of us with certain aspects of his kingdom. How are you doing with the resources God has entrusted to you, with your abilities? And I want to ask you just to close your eyes for a moment and speak to God. Let him reveal that to you. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you now. Maybe there's an area that you need to subject to God and say, Lord, I've taken ownership of this myself. I'm giving it back to you. Just take a moment just where you are and I'll pray for us afterwards. to live your life on your own or maybe you have done that many many years ago but the last few years you were doing this on your own you were trying to survive in your own strength may I ask if if that is you would you just quickly raise your hand and then just lower it again just as a as a sign Lord that I'm submitting my life to you thank you thank you everybody you can lower your hands again I'm going to pray for us Lord, thank you that we can come and submit our lives to you, Lord. Lord, you saw these hands going up, people submitting to your Lordship, Lord. What a privilege, Lord. It's in discovering who you are that we discover who we are. And Lord, I want to pray specifically for those people that raise their hands. Lord, will you come now with your spirit and do what only you can do, Lord. Minister to them, bring forth life in them. And Lord, thank you for bringing a renewal in their hearts and their spirits, Lord. And Lord, also come and bring all of us, Lord. We come and we submit our lives to you and acknowledge that you are the God of all. And Lord, there is freedom in trusting you. And Lord, we say, will you come and have your way in us, Lord? Will you come and guide us? Will you come and lead us? Lord, in difficult times and in brilliant times, Lord, everything that we are, Lord, we bring back to you and say, Lord, may you be glorified through our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.